my name is Colin McNabb. I'm a uh, principal and risk consultant at MJ Insurance. And uh, it's, uh, I got the opportunity to introduce our last speaker today. Um, so I met Matt Hasselback in 2013, uh, right after he joined the Colts. And I actually met him on the field. Uh, but I didn't meet him at Lucas Oil Field. I met him at a middle school soccer field. And our daughters were playing on the same soccer team. And um, I've been a pretty big football fan most of my life, so I knew who he was. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been in Indy since 93, so big Colts fan. Um, I followed his career a little bit. Um, you know, knew he'd been to three Pro Bowls. He, uh, he played in the Super Bowl XL, which apparently stands for 40 and not extra large, I found out <laughs> at some point. But, uh, uh, at any rate, I, I was kind of excited, a little bit nervous to meet him because I you know if you guys, when you meet someone that you consider a celebrity, and to me he was a celebrity because I was a big football fan, he was a very successful football player, so I didn't really know uh, what to expect. And um, over the past three years, I've gotten to know Matt. I've gotten to know him the way uh, many of you probably have if you're Colts fans. Um, first, kind of standing with the clipboard and see him talking in Andrew Luxie or during timeouts, things like that. And then, of course, um, a few times on the field the first two years. And then this last year, uh, quite a few times on the field, um, which he'll probably talk about today. But um, I really feel like I got to know Matt um, and learned a lot about him outside of the Colts. And been able to meet his amazing wife, Sarah, who um, what I learned is that he's mostly a good husband. Um, I've met his three children and learned that he's a great father. Um, I've met his parents, learned that he's a great son, and really see where a lot of who he is comes from. And um, what I've really learned about Matt is that he's a smart, funny, humble guy, and he truly lives his life with faith and purpose. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Matt Hasselbeck. Thanks, Colin. Oh, hello. Are you guys here? Um, so I'm new to this, okay? I got a, like a control thing here. I'm a football player, so I've never done this. I feel uncomfortable in the sport code even. But I just took a new job at ESPN. I haven't started yet, so I figured this would be a good practice. Um, Yes, too bad you couldn't see that video. That video was a Super Bowl commercial that we had shot. Um, you had to announce like the moment when you knew you made it in the NFL, and I remember them asking me, and I was like, I haven't made it. Like, I got nothing. So I told an embarrassing story. So that's kind of what I'm going to do a little bit today. Is this me, or is this somebody else? Can anybody tell me? Um, I'm going to tell a little bit. Of, I'm going to tell you guys some stories today, um, and I guess educate you on football. I know you guys have had a lot of speakers today already, and I know for me, sometimes when I listen to a lot of speakers, it's a great information, I feel like I'm drinking out of a fire hose. And uh, you know, most speakers will give you like three things to remember or some acronym. I'm probably not as good as those people, I'm not as smart as those people, so I'm probably just gonna give you one thing to remember, and um, hopefully I can do that. So that's kind of the question I'm going with. Uh, the difference between a true competitor and a competitor, and that's a question that, uh, that someone asked me, a coach asked me once, and. Uh, you know, he credited it to Kobe Bryant, but I hate the Lakers, so we'll just say Larry Bird said it. Okay? Um, so that's really the question. So, uh, oh, I don't know what that, okay, so th this is my dad. I grew up in a football family. It's my dad, Don, he played in Colorado, and then he played for the Patriots, the Raiders, the Vikings, and the Giants. Uh, so I grew up in a football family. Um, people would ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up. I'd say, I don't know, I, mean, I guess I'll just play in the NFL like my dad. You know, I thought that was normal. Um, because that's what all my friends' parents did, so I didn't know. Um, but I grew up in a football family. My dad played, um, I, I played obviously. My brother Tim played like seven years in the NFL. My brother Nathaniel played at Boston College. My mom was a kicker at the University of Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> kidding, she wasn't. How <laughs> little she is. Okay, but that to me, I was not, I was not as little. Uh, I mentioned my dad played for the Patriots, okay? So uh, he's not a bad guy, okay? <laughs> shooter or anything like that. I was, I was actually a ball boy for the Patriots uh, in high school. All, all my brothers were. That was kind of our job. Um, this game right here, this is the infamous snowplow game. I don't know how much you guys know about football, but um, the Patriots, this is back in like the 70s. 
and uh, there's a playoff game against the Dolphins. And that guy driving the snowplow is actually a prisoner from the prison right next to Foxborough Stadium. And he was out like doing like good works or whatever, uh, or like not good works, but uh, you know on leave or whatever, and for the game like working. And he comes out and plows a spot for John Smith, the kicker from the uh, from from England actually to come kick a game winner against the Patriots. So this is kind of when it all started that people started to sort of not like the Patriots. Um, <laughs> but my dad, sorry, am I too close for that maybe? Just coach me up on that stuff. Okay. So, um, so I mentioned my dad's a good guy. So you know, I was a football family. I grew up in Boston. I went to high school in Boston. I actually had a, played three sports all through high school, but it kind of became clear that football was sort of choosing me. I wanted to play baseball or basketball. Nobody else in the world saw it that way. They saw football. So uh, by my junior year, I started getting scholarship offers from basically every school in the country except for the one I wanted to go to, Stanford. Partly why I don't really like Andrew, Andrew Luck that much. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I wasn't always bald. Like, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys believe that. My kids don't really believe that I have to prove it with pictures. But I had sweet hair back then. And so uh, I, I went to my dad and I was like, hey, dad, you know, you, you're, you know, you're probably not going to have to pay for or help me pay or pay for college tuition because I'm going to get a scholarship. You know, what do you say about a car? I didn't have a car. And um, my dad drove a station wagon. He's six foot eight, so it's the only car I'd fit into anyway. But um, players didn't make that much money back then. And I was like, what do you do about a car? He's like, no way out of the question. And I was like, come on. Like, come on. He's like, all right, I'll tell you what. I need you to do three things. I need you to uh, cut your hair. Your hair looks ridiculous. You look like you're in the Beatles or something, and I have blonde hair. Uh, number two, I need you to uh, I need you to start reading your Bible more. Like I think it'd be a good thing for you to do. And uh, number three, I want you to uh, you know make high honors honorable. So I'm like, okay, all right, fine, whatever, fine. So uh, <laughs> sure enough, grades come out, and I go to my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, um, you know, here's my report card. What do you think? He's like, wow, high honors. I'm impressed. It's good. I've also noticed. Um, You've been reading your Bible more, it's great. You know, even with your friends, good for you. Um, but what's up with your hair? You didn't cut your hair. Your hair's actually longer. And I'm like, so dad, craziest thing. I'm reading my Bible. It turns out, Jesus and all his friends, they have long hair, they have long hair. So I cut him. But then he was like, well, that's, that's actually a great point. And now that you bring it up, I think Jesus and all his friends, they walked everywhere. They walked. <laughs> so that's my dad. Um, so this is my mom, okay? So my mom. So my mom and I, I don't know if you know this, probably don't, but uh, my mom and I were the Campbell's Chunky Soup uh, mom and son thing after, um, was it maybe John and McNabb, I think. And uh, we got fired. We got fired. It was a great deal. It was very lucrative. It was fun. It was, I had a blast. Shot commercials with my mom in Toronto. <sighs> Why did we get fired, you say? Well, they have uh, these things called focus groups, okay? And the focus group said, there's no way that's your mom. She's too young and you're too old. So I told my mom, my mom got fired. She said, why did you get fired? They said, I look too old and you look too young. She's like, that's awesome. I'm like, it's not awesome. It's terrible. So, but that's really my mom. This is my, this is my wife and our kids. I just mentioned them quickly. And they don't behave and they don't get along. So I brought in Conor McGregor for all you UFC. This is a free parenting trip. Uh, tip, if you get to be around UFC uh, fighters, just get them with your kids. And they behave unbelievably. It's a, it's a magic trick. All right, this is me in high school. I went to um, the Varian Brothers High School, and I'm only putting this in because there's a color photo when I was in high school. I had to prove this to some of my teammates last year because this is like 1992 or 93, and uh, the rookies this year were born in 1997. So, uh, so I, went to, I ended up going to Boston College. I had, a, I, had, I had a chance to go really wherever I wanted to go for school, and uh, except for Stanford, I still hate them. And uh, <laughs> but look at these stats. So uh, first of all, I go to Boston College. Why? Because Tom Coughlin. So he, gave, he was coaching my dad with Bill Parcells with the New York Giants on my, on my dad's last team. And I'm like, you know what? This is the kind of guy I would, would, would want to play for. This guy's going to be a great coach someday. I kind of chased him. And, oh, yeah, BC is a good school. Um, so I go to BC. Well, three months later, he leaves and takes a job as the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Well, I'm stuck at BC for five years. He left. So. Um, I made the most of it. I found my wife, which was great. But, uh, but look at these stats here. I think I got a laser point. Four for six for 39 yards in 94. It's pretty good. 280 <laughs> yards passing in 95. Seriously. Well, look at, look at this. this is the back of this football card someone sent to me. In 96, negative 214 yards of rushing. I mean, how do you do that? For, but uh, for, for my career at BC. Negative 188 yards rushing. 
I mean, and look at this. Like, what's the best thing we can say about you on the back of your card? Uh, you won a game 12 to 7. <laughs> so <laughs> this guy must be really legit. Um, so I need to say, um, like Peyton Manning, I did not win the Heisman Trophy. You know, Charles Woodson won it our year. And, uh, but I never lost a bowl game. Never lost a bowl game, but I never played in a bowl game. <laughs> That's really out of bowl game, but this guy played in a bowl game. You know, we're like, yeah, this is fun, man. This is, he got you know, the stuff knocked out of him that day. So and we had a good time in a bowl game, even without him. Um, so when I graduate from BC, I have a pro workout day. I don't know if you know how that works. It's like uh, before or after the combine, and I have a pro workout day. You invite all the teams, all the coaches, all the scouts to your pro workout day. So I had my pro workout day at BC. One person showed up. This is my agent over here on the right, Andrew Brandt. You might see him on, uh, on ESPN right now, Stanford guy. He told me uh, that he wished I went to Stanford. So I said, oh, OK, well, you can be my agent. I'll hire you. Um, he has this pro day. Only one guy shows up, this guy, Andy Reid, the quarterback's coach of the Green Bay Packers. And uh, I don't know if you guys know how this works, but uh, this, is, this is how it works. He, quarterback coach comes and he works you out. And you'll see it on ESPN, they put you through all these tests. Well, it was snowing that day, and he says, well, does Boston College have an indoor facility? I'm like, oh, no, we don't, but we'll just throw in the snow. And he was like, ah, it's okay. I don't feel like it. I live in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I don't need to be in the snow anymore. But I appreciate the fact that you were willing to go throw in the snow. So he never even saw me throw. So I'm thinking, all right, well, this is going very poorly. So he puts me on a chalkboard, or maybe it was a dry erase board. Um, and he says, all right, drop your favorite play. So I drop red, right, 22, Texas, Y out. X dagger halfback M, obviously, right? So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was like, what do you even mean? I wasn't really that prepared. Well, basically, what it's saying is like, drop your favorite play versus man. It's good versus man, good versus zone, it's good versus cover two, cover three, quarters. He wants to see how much football IQ you have. And he doesn't care necessarily if you know his offense. He wants to know how you know your offense, and he'll teach you. And uh, it's all a big test. And so I, I dropped that play. And he's like, I see you've done your homework. I'm like, uh, what do you mean? And he goes, oh, this is just the number one uh, go-to play of the Green Bay Packers. You know, we just come off our second consecutive Super Bowl. And I know you know this is the play we hit in the Super Bowl against the Broncos. I had no idea. <laughs> like, total accident. And then he goes, he's like, it's so refreshing that you're prepared. He's like, our quarterback, Brett Favre, um, you know, at his pro day, or at his, yeah, they said, okay, drop, you know, give us your favorite play. What's good versus every coverage? He's like, oh man, this is a tough one, man. I love the hook and lateral, and I love the flea flicker. You know, I love them both. So, um, at least he thought I was smart, but I really wasn't. Um, I'm actually a little bit nervous telling you guys all this stuff. I know the Colts are practicing downtown tonight, and the, our team hotel is in the West End, so I've stayed in that hotel so many times that I get nervous, like telling you guys a little bit behind the curtain, inside the locker room type stuff, because Chuck's the same, and Chuck's a great guy. You guys know him. He's a personable guy. He's got that. You know, what you see here stays here. It's like, it's like I don't know if it's like they're nervous about playbooks, they're nervous about what. But, um, so I'm a little nervous, but I, I, like, I retired just a few months ago, so they can't do anything to me, so I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys just some of this is just sort of some random stuff in the locker room. I don't know. Uh, burn these slides later. Okay, so this is actually pretty cool. I took these pictures. So these are basically a collection of pictures that I take on my cell phone that I would love to Instagram or tweet, but I can't because I'll get fined for doing so. And only Pat McAfee is the guy that is willing to do it. <laughs> uh, so this is in the locker room of the Denver Broncos Stadium, which uh, what used to be called Mile High. Uh, this is me over here. I, I signed this when it was empty. And then we went back and played these guys in the playoffs. And uh, there's like four walls of this. So it's pretty cool. Um, there's Big Man right there. There's Sean Alexander. This is, it was kind of cool. So I thought that was neat. The green dot, okay? Do you guys know what the green dot is on the on the helmet? So you're watching an NFL football game. Every quarterback will have a green dot, and every either middle linebacker or safety will have the green dot. What that is, that's the coach to quarterback communication system. And so in each helmet that has a green dot are these like, it looks like eight triple A batteries, like dead series. And uh, it's like a receiver and two speakers and all these wires. It's like extra stuff that goes in your helmet so the coach on the sideline, they're so paranoid. They always like put something up over their, over their mouth, like a play cut, and like, all right, we got red, right, twenty-two, Texas, wide out. You know, like, like anyone, like, what are you gonna do about it? And like the next ten seconds, you're gonna tell the line. That you're <laughs> you know? So anyway, if you're curious, that's what that. Means. Um, okay, so this is like the pre-game schedule for the Colts. This is how we do it. Um, part of the reason that this technology stuff is foreign to me is because coaches, 
Like we recently just put our playbook on an iPad recently. And we recently got high def film to watch like games from on. My children watched Dora the Explorer 10 years ago in high def and we're watching NFL film in standard definition. So it, this is why, but these are the, these are the pre-game things. It'll usually say if the roof's open or closed. And so like I'll Snapchat it to my wife and kids so they know whether to bring like a jacket to the game or not or whatever. So, but this is, this is just a little something about Andrew Luck, okay? Um, it's 12.09 that we go out for a 102 game, like full pads, ready to get warmed up. He wants to be out an hour and 40 minutes before this to do what? To warm up. I'm like, okay, to, well, what are we warming up? We're activating our glutes. He goes, come on, we gotta go activate our glutes. Those are your muscles, okay? So we do exercises like this. So if you ever get to the game early enough, you'll see the quarterbacks doing all these like crazy, uh, it's Andrew's like activate your glutes program. Pretty funny. <laughs> What's also funny about it is this is Andrew right here, probably five hours before the game. So wherever we are, here or the hallway, He'll go for like, he'll get in like costume and get headphones on, he'll go for like a walk. But it's like a power walk like your grandfather would do, you know what I mean? Like you see those people in the mall like early in the morning, and it's like their workout time, and they're just like, you know, they're just powering away. And that's him, hot socks, he'll wear like high compression socks. And I really think people ask me about his like neck beard, and I really think this is kind of the reason why. You know, just it's part of the disguise on Sunday morning. Um, I don't know what it is for you guys at your work um, or even where you work, but uh, we have random drug testing. It's pretty normal. So you walk in, you go to your locker, and there'll be a, this note. Again, not very high tech. Could send you a text or something. <laughs> or you could cut it with scissors. And uh, hey, you've been randomly selected. So come on down and pee. You know, basically is how we do it. So um, in case you're curious, I don't know, maybe you're not. <laughs> All right, so I, I played 18 years, so this is my 18th training camp last year at Anderson University. And if you want to know the real reason I retired, is because this is what you get when you're a vet. Like, this is the best of the best of the best at training camp. Not only do I get the big bed, which is a twin bed and twin bed pushed together and a little, like, uh, piece of styrofoam on top, I get it, my own refrigerator. And I get a dresser, you can't see it, but it's a desk. And it's really cool. I mean, what else could you possibly want, right? <laughs> and that, what also comes with this is at 11 o'clock, a coach and a police officer come to your room. They open the door with a flashlight and they say, hey, turn your lights out. I'm like, I'm 40 years old. You go to bed. Right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it. <laughs> I'm going to focus out to your feet. You get an uh, outlet there and an outlet there and an outlet there. So really exciting. Okay, I don't know if you guys bring your robes to work. I don't know if you guys do that, but that's something that uh, we've done with Pat, with Adam, and myself. Um, pictures in the locker room are very rare. This would get you fine if you were a player. I'm not a player, so we're going to look at the pictures. And then post game interviews. Um, you know, kind of the weatherman, though. You get your, you know, you get your, your tie, your jacket, um, you know, pants. It's not necessary. And these guys are pros, they're just, you know, doing their business. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you who that is, though. That would be embarrassing. And Max, shoot, thank you if I told you anyway. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, back to some real stuff. OK, so in 1998, that was the NFL draft. That was the year I got drafted. And uh, uh, I was not invited to the NFL combine here in Indianapolis. I was not invited. I don't know why. Those stats were legit. I don't know what the, what the problem was. Uh, so I was not invited to the NFL draft in New York City either. And in fact, you know, my pro day, just, just one person showed up. But this draft will forever be remembered, even despite all those things, as, you know, the, you know this draft. It's picks 1-2 and 187. I'm sure you know it. 1-2 and 187, Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf, and myself. And the Colts had a tough decision to make that year, right? <laughs> and they made the right decision, I think. But it was tough. It was like, a, you know, who do we go with? But uh, that, that's the draft right there. And so I got drafted to the Green Bay Packers. And uh, I played behind this guy. Uh, we had a good relationship. I think I spit in his face right there. So. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was there three years, and basically I was the first team holder for field goals. That was my only chance to get on the field. Had a great time. It was like being at Harvard Business School for being a young quarterback. Uh, the coaching, the, the, uh, him the, he coming off of his third consecutive NFL MVP and second consecutive Super Bowl. Uh, it wasn't all smooth there. It was, I played my first preseason game in Tokyo, Japan against the Chiefs, and uh, threw an interception and got hit and landed on the 
second base area and played in a baseball field and sprained my tailbone, which would be bad enough, but it was a 19 hour flight home, so I was standing for like the whole thing, it was terrible. Um, but my first touchdown pass, this was here, I don't think we have, is this video, is this video gonna work? We'll see, we'll take a try. If it works, it works. But I had a first, my first touchdown pass was on a fake field goal. And uh, I'll just tell you what happened. So basically, my friend, he's also another backup. Um, we had, we're like, hey, this is Monday Night Football against Randy Moss and the Vikings, and this is a huge game, and this fake is totally gonna work. Like, they sell out to get a block, and this is totally gonna work. And what's our end zone celebration gonna be? Back then, the NFL didn't find you for having fun end zone celebrations. So we had a whole, like, dance routine set up, right? Well. Um, he like abandons the plan and he does his own thing. His name is Jeff Thomason. He does like a big T, like a shout out to his grandmother or something, like Thomason, yay. And so <laughs> I'm like a jerk. I'm running down to celebrate and I'm like, you know what? The heck was that? I just threw my first NFL touchdown pass. I'm just going to jump on the pile and celebrate. Well, the pile moves. Like as I'm in the air, I'm like, no! And I just face plant on the astroturf. <laughs> It's not even field turf, it's astro turf. Uh, so, I don't know, well, that's the story. If this works, it works, and I don't think it worked. Okay, so it's a, it's, that's exactly how it went down. So just real quick, so I, I, I was in Green Bay, I was with Mike Holmgren with, with um, all these different coaches, and Mike McCarthy was my quarterback's coach, and um, I learned a lot from this guy. I mean, uh, you know, he's kind of a master of quarterback footwork. He does a great job with Aaron Rodgers, and really taught me so many things that are important in quarterbacking. Like, for example, like, you know, these, we have all these stats that come out and be like, oh, 35% of the time they're gonna bring a blitz from the strong side, and 28% of the time they're gonna bring a blitz from the weak side. This guy helped me greatly figure out, like, so what? Like, you're giving me all this information, like, why do I care about it? Like, why does it even matter? He was great, but you know, um, you know, so one of the best things he did was just study skills. And I was a person in high school, I mean, really school in general, a lot like my kids, my kids, why do I have enough to know this? Like, when am I ever going to need to know this? And, you know, the answer is, like, you're learning, reading, writing, analytical skills, problem solving skills, study skills. Um, those study skills that I learned in school, I learned, I use for, for football, for my job. And, uh, you know, one thing that I learned from him is he had, he had coached Joe Montana and some other guys, and he was like, here's what you need to do. You need to get your wife to get the playbook and have her pretend to be the coach that's on the headset, the green dot, and tell you the play. So, She'll call up the play and you have to memorize the formation. So my wife would say, okay, we're gonna go heavy personnel, sprint right G, you corner, half back flat. And I'm gonna have to know it's red, left, swap tight, close to right, sprint right G, you corner, half back flat. And it was like those types of study things that help you as a young quarterback master the offense. It gives the coaching staff and your teammates confidence in you. Like you step in the huddle, I see it all the time, you get young quarterbacks. I have job security because young quarterbacks in this league can't just step in and call a play. So they get in and they're like, um, Red, left, swap, tight, close, um, Z, right? And there's such a difference between that and someone who steps in and just owns it and knows it and says, all right, guys, here we go. We got red, left, swap, tight, close, Z, right? Turn right, G, U, corner, half, back, flat. I don't want to wonder, you know, like that kind of a thing. And, um, you know, it could be trips right, Z, or left, two, jet, or watch shallow cross. You know, it's like all those plays. So um, I really credit Mike McCarthy, and he was a no name coach. He was no uh, position coach, and no surprise at all for me that he went on to be. Uh, such a great head coach. Um, from there, I got traded to uh, the Seattle Seahawks, and this is probably my most challenging uh, job. It was the first time I went, went from being like the backup in some, someone's shadow to being the starting quarterback. And Mike Holmgren had been training with the San Francisco 49ers under uh, Bill Walsh, and this guy, like, from day one, he was like, I'm gonna push you harder than you've ever been pushed, than you ever thought you could be pushed. Uh, it was such a challenge working for him as a boss that like you know, I got to Sundays, and it was like, all right, this is easy. <laughs> I'll, I'll go play against the Eagles or the Niners or the Cardinals. Like, at least it's not practice with this guy. And it was a, it was a challenge. And uh, you know, he was a great teacher. He was actually a high school teacher, and he'd have these sayings that I didn't really understand him at the time. But uh, you got to walk before you can run. He was like a teaching progression type of coach. But uh, I would say the best thing that I learned from him, and I would say if you were to ask Andrew Luck if there's anything he learned from me. Um, it's nothing of my own originality. It's sort of like a nugget that I got from him. And it's, uh, as a quarterback, you're, you're not a blacksmith, you're an artist. And there's, there's not just like one way to do things. And you don't necessarily have to, uh, it's not math. It's not like two plus two is four. You're painting a canvas, he would say. And uh, 
And, and I don't know if that makes any sense to you at all, but uh, it, it was just a, it was kind of a brilliant, brilliant coaching point that uh, has really helped being a quarterback in the NFL. Um, so I finished my career with Pete Carroll, who also is another great coach, um, and he's had success. And he, he, you know, a lot of coaches I had had a ton of rules. Pete had three rules, and he had kind of had the John Madden philosophy that if you have a bunch of rules, people are just going to start breaking the rules. So just find out for you what is actually really absolutely non-negotiable, important to you, and let's let's you know make that the core value of what we are. And uh, his three rules were, were interesting, you know. Um, his rule number one, if you were to ask any player, any person in the entire building, hey, what's rule number one? The entire building knows it. It's like, it's, it's like part of who they are. Number one for him is protect the team. And in a football setting, that is, uh, that is like, hey, take care of each other in practice. You know, don't, don't have injuries in practice. But I think for us, in a, in a unique way, there's so many young players in a locker room. And uh, you know, just one, one real example would be like drinking and driving. Okay, so drinking and driving is a problem in our country, a problem in our locker room. And uh, Pete, Pete had kind of a philosophy to protect the team. If you got in trouble for drinking and driving, there's a really strong chance that you would never be on this team again. You'd be gone. But equally, and maybe even more at fault, would be the buddy that was there that knew this person would have been drinking and driving that did nothing about it. And that was kind of Pete's like protect the team, protect the team, protect the team. And uh, that also goes into, for us in our locker room, it's really easy to. Uh, talk, talk trash about your coach, your boss, your coach, or a teammate. And uh, it's like, it happens on every team, but it's just uncool, unaccepted, not allowed. And uh, that was a challenge. And I think for us as a team, we really came together and kind of on this rule two violator, no rule two violators, of, uh, of protecting the team. And then it kind of flows right into number two, which is no whining, no complaining, no excuses, which again, falls right into that protecting the team. And his third rule would be, be on time. And it's really be early. So be on time, be early. It's, uh, it's just a sign of respect. That's all it is. It's a sign of respect that you think what we're about to do in this next meeting is important. And for me, as a quarterback in the NFL, um, you're always early to the pass game stuff. And when it comes to the running game, kind of there's a lot of guys that roll their eyes and they're just strolling in late. Like, oh, are we handing off uh, to the left for odd numbers and handing off to the right for even numbers still? And you just kind of do that. And so this was a kind of a sign of respect thing. Um, so we had a good run in Seattle. This is, uh, this is my last game, I think my last home game in Seattle. It's uh, uh, my son on my shoulders and my daughter. This ball right here is that Marshawn Lynch beast mode ball. Like he tried to save it, or I tried to save it for him. He celebrated, I saved it, I gave it to our equipment guy. I'm like, save this ball for Marshawn. Well, he's sort of a, you know, weird dude. He put it back into the game when I took a knee, and I got a broken wrist, and my kids are on the field after the game. I got the ball. I give it to my daughter. NFL Films has got this big investigation going, trying to figure out where the ball is. It's in my 13-year-old daughter's bedroom. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I mean, my bad. I didn't even put the ball back. So, um, but Seattle, we really had a great run. We did not win the Super Bowl. Um, Super Bowl 40, we were fortunate to play against the Steelers. We, Really should have played against the Colts that year, but uh, um, I don't think the Steelers should have even been there. Never mind, won it. I was actually with my family in Africa. Okay, and I don't know if you guys know how this works. They print up winning T-shirts for the teams that win, and you know, one team's gonna win, one team's gonna lose. And the team that loses, they ship it to like a third world country, just so it's like hidden, but it's like you know, clothing <laughs> somebody. Clearly, someone thinks like I do. They shouldn't have won. I see this kid in Malawi, Africa, the most royal country even in Africa, wearing a Steelers Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl 40. So, I don't know. But they tell me we lost, but I'm not sure. Okay. So, um, I don't even know what this is for. Okay, so yeah, talking about a team. Okay, so talking about a team, like, we really understood what a team was. And, and it took all different types, right? All different types. And, and I was talking to somebody recently about you know, putting together a team. And said, you know, like Calvin Johnson. Calvin Johnson's like the greatest wide receiver ever. You know, he's six foot six and a half, runs a four three forty. Um, he's as good as you could imagine for a wide receiver. But you would never want a team of twenty two Calvin Johnson. You'd be the worst team in the world. You know, like Peyton Manning. You, you, he's great. Probably the greatest quarterback to ever play. But you'd never want eleven Peyton Mannings on your offense. Like it'd be awful. Like you don't want it. You know, you don't want all offense linemen. You don't want all receivers. And so. I just, that's one of the things I, I really like it in, uh, about football and just, you know, having the right people in the right spots is just so important. And uh, 
I'm gonna come back. The irony is though, okay, like what if you do have two Peyton Mannings, okay? This is, this is the thing, like you don't need them, right? So who do you keep? Well, uh, you guys I think are in HR, so you know you keep the younger, cheaper person, obviously. <laughs> it's hurtful, it's hurtful. There's my guy, Marshawn. With me with my lids hat, so I fix it for you guys. Okay. Um, so this guy right here, I need to give him a shout out. So I got a little banged up this year. We had some, um, we had some turn turnover on the offensive line this year. I guess would be a nice way to say it. And uh, this guy, Kyle, he's like the athletic trainer. In our team, if you were to pull our players, and, um, and, and I think they may even do this, but if you were to pull our players, everyone's absolute favorite, like the glue of our organization, the people that no one could survive without are these athletic trainers. And this is Kyle Davis. He, his wife and him, they had their first baby uh, the day that we played the Miami Dolphins. And so he was not in Miami, and that was, I, that was the last game I ever played. Like literally and figuratively, it's hard to survive without these guys. And uh, he's also got the uh, World Cup uh, office pool going here too. So they, they serve numerous, uh, numerous uh, roles. Okay, so I was at the Tennessee Titans um, after Seattle out of the lockout. I was a victim of that, you know, Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck type thing there. Um, but also here, I go here, I mean, I did two years here. I actually had the best statistics, uh, statistically the best year of my career, but we had an eighth, the eighth pick overall in the draft. Uh, not quite Andrew Luck. So I go on spring break with my family. I go on spring break with my family, and while on spring break, we get into like one of these little like uh, um, ownership player squabbles. And we're just chilling. My, my cell phone's over its minutes. We're actually in the Caribbean, so I can't make a phone call. Like, I don't even know what happened. I get a call from my agent on St. Patrick's Day, like late at night, and it was probably not the right time to take this kind of a call. And I'm like, no, the heck with it. Tell them to cut me. And so I come back two days later. I'm a member of the Indianapolis Colts. It was like the most random set of circumstances. On the air, I should say this, I happened to sit next to Adam Benatari on the airplane. Our kids are like the same age, and it went nice. And, Colts came calling, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, Adam said good things, just go there. That was the craziest thing. We got home to America, and we're like, ah, I think I play for the Colts now. It was very bizarre. <laughs> so we came up, and one of the reasons I came is like in 2012, there was like something special that was going on here in Indy. You know, Chuck was fighting cancer, and how the team had rallied around him, the community, really the country had rallied around him, and I was just so impressed with him, and, and really everyone here, that we signed up here, and I got up here, I was here a year and a half, okay? And we had these t-shirts that say BTM, like on everything. BTM, BTM, Chuck's giving pep talks. He's like, BTM, and I'm like, yeah, BTM. It was a year and a half till I had the courage to ask somebody. I'm like, what's BTM mean? Like, no one knew, no one knew. So finally a few guys, you know, I went to one of the Stanford guys, and they're like, oh, that means build the monster? And so it was about some pep talk that they gave in 2012. But like, as a new person on the team, like. It would have been, it would have made my first year so much nicer if I just kind of knew the acronyms, kind of knew the window. So, uh, speaking of Andrew Luck, because he was the one who told me, uh, this is a question I get a lot. What's Andrew Luck like? What's Andrew Luck like? I'll get interview requests. Uh, Sports Illustrated's in town, they want to talk to you. I'm like, oh great, what are they want to talk about? Oh, uh, what's Andrew Luck? You know, so um, I'll just get it out of the way. Um, he's closer in age to my kids than he is to me, so he's better friends with them. So this picture up here is probably uh, this is probably the best um, depiction of what our relationship's really like. Okay? <laughs> it's the end of um, but he's a great, great guy. He's a foodie. He loves his farm table restaurants in Indy. He almost cried last year when our bistro on Passat, his favorite restaurant, uh, went out of business. Uh, he loves soccer. We, you know, on the road, we'll go and we'll get like in an Uber or a taxi and we'll go somewhere. And immediately, for some reason, taxi drivers seem to be big soccer fans also. He knows like the score of the Turkey versus Albania game. He's in like a full on conversation about it. So uh, that's another thing. He toured, basically toured with AWOL Nation, the band this summer. Like he's a little bit of a groupie that way. Um, he took us to Louisville actually to see him and it was actually really fun. But uh, and he just started the Andrew Luck Book Club, which uh, I highly recommend if anybody's on there. And he is running his own Twitter, not from a phone, um, no smartphone, but from a flip phone. He still has a flip phone. Um, but he does have an iPad, I can say that. Okay. Um, so I, I think this is one of the things I wanted to say to you guys. So in the, in the NFL locker room, I think one of the biggest challenges of being the quarterback of a, lock, of a team in the locker room or a leader in the locker room 
is just the culture and how it changes every, every year. Here are the quotes. They say trust, loyalty, and respect. That's Chuck's, you know, you'll see that plastered everywhere in the building. But you know, for us, it's a new locker room every year. You have new players every year. You have 10 new draft picks. You have, you have uh, 10 new free agents. That's 20 new people coming in to make your team. And it's fine, it's great. Like, everyone's all excited. Hey, we got a new center this year. Yeah, well, that just means you said goodbye to two other centers. And, um, and I, I think it's, it's sometimes hard to say hello to a new teammate when maybe you're still bitter that like a good, good friend of yours just you know, got kicked out the door. And um, that's a real thing that we have to do. And, and there's so many challenges that, you know, I mentioned that this year's rookie class, some of those guys were born in 1897. I mean, that's, uh, my prom was 1993. And so um, that, that's a real thing. And I would say that coming to the Colts, and one of the reasons I did choose to come to the Colts was that this culture had been set. Kind of, you know, um, I give a lot of credit to the, to the Peyton Mannings and the Robert Mathises and those guys, the, the Jeff Saturdays, that had set the culture in this, like what it meant to be a pro in this team is different than what it means to be a pro on other teams. And, uh, and that standard is learned and it's just, it just becomes the norm. And I think for here, here at this team, um, you know, what does that mean? Like if I had to sum it up quickly to a, to a rookie, I would say, hey, just be a pro. Like just be a pro. You know, like just realize this is your job. Be, be a pro. And all you gotta do is your job. You don't have to do anybody else's job, but we are counting on you to do this. And, uh, and you know, like there's some non-negotiables that don't even need to be set. Like be on time. Like it doesn't ever need to be set. When I got to Tennessee, I came from Seattle, went to Tennessee, and I was replacing a quarterback that was not very professional. And uh, I'll never forget the, the director of PR came up to me and said, hey, thanks for coming, to, thanks for coming on time today. I'm like, when else would I come? Like, it's my job. Like, what are you even talking about? And uh, you know, don't make the same mistake twice. Like, that's a big thing. Coaches are cool. Like, if you can't call um, trip trades, even left you did expect to watch how across the forty. Like, that's okay. But like the second time, you better you better go home and talk in the mirror until you've got it down. Um, don't make the same mistake twice. And then finish the play. This is like. Play to the whistle. Um, quarterbacks, we have idioms like coaches will say, you drive for five, you hand the ball up, you drive for five steps. Um, there's these little things, but in football, it sort of corrects itself. Like, that's the easiest way to get hurt if you don't finish the play. Like, if you don't follow through, you're, you're gonna be gone, you're gonna get hurt. Um, so this is another picture I should not be showing you. This is my locker right here. Uh, and, you know, it's like kind of neat. In 10 years or more, you get two lockers, it kind of goes this way. These guys over here are slobs, okay? <laughs> so these people are like, like, maybe it doesn't matter, right? But it matters to the head coach. Trust, loyalty, respect. It matters to the head coach. And so NFL, if you kind of behave like this, it stands for not for long, you know? And, and these are good guys, and I don't mean to signal, signal them out, but it's like none of those guys are here anymore on this team. Now this is, this is my locker again. Like, this goes right, okay? This is Jack Doyle. He's like one of the best ever. Um, undrafted, lowest paid guy on the team, got cut from the Tennessee Titans who, you know, had a hard time winning a game, they, you know. Um, why is he so successful? Why is he doing so well? Our special teams coach at a point last year was frustrated that our younger players weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. He had these bracelets made up. They said WWJDD, and it was, what would Jack Doyle do, okay? And he said, oh guys, if you, right before a play starts, like right before the play starts, Take a deep breath and say to yourself, what would Jack Doyle do? And it's just like, I don't know if you could have a higher compliment from a coach, but this guy just does things right. He gets the culture. He gets like what we're trying to be about, and he'll have a long career. Not the biggest, not the strongest, not the fastest. I went to Western Kentucky, I think, and they were his only uh, scholarship offer, and I just found out the other day. I think it was like his, his uncle was the coach there at the time. So, I mean, um, <laughs> Anyway, so to Chuck Pagano, this is Chuck Pagano. This is like one thing Chuck Pagano. So this is me taking notes in our board. You know, it's like it started out the first day, it's kind of a dry erase board, and we're taking notes. This is what Chuck Pagano wants, though. He wants nameless faces, okay? He wants this over here, and he doesn't want this over here. So it, this really helped me as a quarterback, um, helped our team. It's going to kill me as an announcer, though, or as a broadcaster. What, so get ready to play the, let's just say we're getting ready to play the Denver Broncos. And you're going up against Champ Bailey. And you're like, so, so now we're studying film Chuck's way. Champ Bailey's like nine Pro Bowls. He's a very, very great player. And, uh, but he's older now. He can't run. So he, now, now the film on our scouting report will say 24, plays high, needs to play lower, uh, can't run, 
uh, double move him. He's the guy. He's, he's a guesser, educated guesser. You know, he's the guy we got to go after this week. Okay, cool. In my 24, we won't have 24. That's easy to say. It's hard to say, hey, we're going to go after Champ Bailey. Champ Bailey's a stiff. Champ Bailey can't play. Champ Bailey's a Hall of Famer. And so kind of this mindset that Chuck had, like, let the film tell the truth. You know, let the film, doesn't matter how successful someone's been, how successful an opponent's been, um, the facts are the facts of what they are each and every year. Um, so that'll kill me at ESPN. ESPN, I was just actually just talking to my boss about coming in for an orientation. He's like, oh, it'd be really simple, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, actually Richard Sherman's gonna be that, there that day. And I'm like, ah, uh, the 25 for the Seahawks? <laughs> and people are like, no, you know, my kids are like, yeah, you know who that is, come on. So, Alright, so this is the last thing I want to talk to you guys about. And this is really just like the essence of, if, if I were to say one thing that made a difference in my career, or one thing that could help any football player, any quarterback, is just this difference between being a competitor versus a true competitor. And uh, I've seen it firsthand, leadership is just so contagious. It can be contagious in a good way, it can be contagious in a bad way. Uh, I mentioned that I played with Brett Favre for my first year there, which was last year with drugs and alcohol and drinking you know, all that stuff. And his second year, my second year was his year trying to quit. His third year was the year he did quit. And it was just fascinating, um, you know, just the dynamics of the things that I saw there with that. But uh, it doesn't even have to be that much. So basically the story is this. So we run sprints all the time. We run sprints all the time as football players. And, and or we, we even run laps. And one thing that happens is, Coaches, I've noticed really good coaches, they don't just like, all right, you know, we're just running, they're just like, you know, gabbing away, just talking. They're studying their players. They're studying what's going on. And like, I'll, I'll use the example of running laps. Like a lot of times players will run laps. And or they'll run gassers, which is across the field, 53 in the third yards each way. And coaches will sit there and see, like there's players that'll, that'll be running and they'll be telling guys, like, hey, hey, slow down, slow down, slow down. Like, don't run too fast. All right, there's those guys, okay? And you know, those, that's something the coaches observe. But I think for me, I was never one of those guys. This is what I was, though. I was, I was just a regular competitor. Um, that, the guy who says, slow down, you're not even a competitor. I don't even know what you are. You're just, I don't really want you on my team. But uh, competitor, that's what I was. I would run sprints, and I would, get, I would usually be first, okay? I'd be first, but I would be first because I would be like this, looking around from the corner of my eye, like, Am I in front of everybody? Yeah, I'm in front of it. I was only going to run as fast as I needed to run. You know, the people that were around me. And um, that wasn't, that wasn't being a true competitor. A true competitor is not concerned with how fast the person to the left or the right is. I'm just trying to do the best that I can do. I'm trying to beat yesterday's version of me. I'm trying to like get better myself. And where that has really, really helped me is in competition with other quarterbacks. Uh, when I was in Green Bay, my second year, I had to compete with Rick Meyer from Notre Dame, who I had a picture of him in my room when I was growing up. And now I'm competing with him for Brett Favre's backup job. And he's a great friend of, to me, and he was super nice to me. And this went on through. I was competing with Trent Dilfer. I was competing with Jake Locker. Even here, the young quarterbacks we had here, it was so much easier when I had kind of this true, true competitive mindset. I'm not really competing against you. In fact, I know I'm not. I'm competing against anybody in the world that they can find to do this job better. So I'm just going to focus on me and how can I, what can I do to get better. Um, you know, uh, our quarterbacks coach, Clyde Christensen, he's here forever with Coach Peyton Manning and Coach Andrew. Uh, now he's down in Miami, Dolph the Miami Dolphins as their offensive coordinator. He had a saying for December football. You know, we kind of had a, a, a routine that we would follow. He, he was like, right, December football, December football, here's what you got to do, guys. You don't have to swing the axe hard, but you have to sharpen the blade. And that was really what we did, you know, and he would talk about, um, uh, you know, just, just really that mindset of like, look internally, okay, you, you know what's coming up, you know, let's just start with no, don't let anything get in the way of you becoming a better you each and every day. And, uh, and the irony about all of this is like, really when you don't focus on that, you make every, you raise the level of play of each person around you. And that's ultimately what the quarterback's supposed to do. The quarterback is supposed to help the other people around uh, him be the best that they could possibly be. And uh, it's so freaky, and I'll say this, for, I've played in some games we've won, some games we've lost, when I've done everything that I could, uh, and I know that, then it's just, it, it feels like a win even when you don't win, because you do your best. So, um, that's it for me. You won't see me playing football anymore. You'll see me here 
um, for the next four at ESPN, not Burger King. If you see me at Burger King, <laughs> if you see me at Burger King, take a picture, tag me, publicly shame me, because I need to be gone. Okay? <laughs> I need to start to be but uh, thank you very much. And, uh, I think, I don't know how we have, uh, yeah. I'm open for a couple questions, like press conference style. Um, <laughs> some of the writers here in Indy could be a little mean press conference style. So don't, I trust you, I trust this group a little bit. But, uh, yeah, take a couple of questions. Yeah, let's, so. we got time for like maybe a couple of questions here, and then we want to wrap up. So, fire away. Yeah, kind of cheesy, but what do you miss most? What do I miss most? Yeah. Um, well, so there's a there's a restaurant here called Elbow Room on uh, you guys know it? <laughs> and they do Thursday night trivia, and like you know, I run on this group text, and everyone like ah, oh, Elbow Room group trivia night, you know. And I don't know if they don't go anymore. If I'm just off the list, am I off the list? Like what happened? So. Um, I've kind of missed some of that stuff. Like, I, I get it, it's a new team every year. And these guys, like I mentioned, um, it's really hard to accept and say hello to new teammates until you kind of say goodbye to other ones, you know? So like, you know, the Kobe Fleeners and the Jarrell Freeman, some of these guys are gone. You know, they're, they're like your blood brothers in that locker room. Like you gotta, you sort of gotta make room for building new relationships. So uh, I'd say that. Uh, being sensitive, seeing things through the lens of that person. So, as an example, I cringe. Uh, this year, I was cringing during the draft. So, we drafted an offensive lineman in the first round. So now, uh, and everyone's like, yeah, we finally fixed the old line. You know, that's what they're saying. Well, in my head, two of our good buddies, that's their job. It is a slap in the face to them, to their family. Not only the centers, to the whole, everyone. Like, oh, the offensive line was the problem, the offensive line was the problem. Yeah, well, stopping the run was a problem. I mean, turning the ball over was a problem. You, you know, so like just trying to see things through everybody's lens and being sensitive. You know, we have a lot of teammates that click on Twitter, it's like, welcome to the family, you know, da, 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 da. You know, it's just like, well, I mean, well, what am I? You know, and so just, I think, seeing things through the lens of, of, of that person. And it works both ways. Like, there's, there's scouts that cut people. Like, you're the person that come up and they go, hey, give me your playbook and you're fired, basically. And like people don't like those guys. It's like they hate that job more than you hate being cut. Like you know how hard it is because it's usually like the young person, the youngest scout has to go do it. You know, and it's just a I don't envy it. And, and it's a you know I guess probably that'd be my 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 trick. Yeah, uh, I don't know. In my in my job, it's usually the opposite. Like the old people are the, like the, the we don't want to be with the old people, you know. Like, <laughs> you know, like either you're gonna rat us out, or you know. I think the best thing that, that I've done with my is I've stayed current on social media stuff, and it's helped me learn my guys. Like I don't actually have to get to know uh, everybody. Uh, I got a call from a high school here. Uh, a couple years ago and said, hey, we're looking for a couple mentors. Would you recommend a guy? These are some people that were recommended to me. And uh, I was Snapchat friends with one of the guys and I was like, and he seemed like it. I was like, no, like, please no. I would not recommend this person. You know, so I think maybe just staying current and relevant and just have a general awareness of, of um, like a general friendship that, that's going on. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's usually the opposite. Yeah, so we have a we have a thing. Uh, every team has it. Um, it's a player engagement director, and some are good, some are bad, some are great. The best one I've ever seen is here in Indianapolis. 
for the cold, so named David Thornton. So we did a game plan book. So you have your playbook in Encyclopedia, and now it's on an iPad. But you get a game plan book, which is like a smaller binder of just like the absolute need to knows for this game. Just only thing you need to know to win this game. And like when I came here, he made my adjustments so much easier. He gave me like little cheat sheet plugins for anything and everything I would need in Indiana. And he put some serious work into it. But it was it was locked and loaded. Like you need a drive cleaner, boom. You need a that and so like, um, you know, top three restaurants, top three this, you know, and just it was perfect. And you like, hey, if you go to the airport, park on the third floor. You know, just like any little nugget that and I, I think how we did it, I could be wrong. Uh, he might have like sent a survey out to uh, like the wives and the girlfriends, like, hey, who's your favorite dog sitter? Who's your favorite? And so what that did for me is it allowed me to focus on my job. And all this, I didn't have to waste any extra time. You know, I trusted it. I trusted him. And it was people that were seeing things through the same lens as me. Um, that was incredibly, incredibly helpful. And I got it because it was a playbook. Like, I know how to get it. had the tabs. And like, boom, boom. I, I know my way around the playbook. If he had done it some other way, like, he had sent someone on my team an email, like there's a 50% chance that thing's getting opened. Like, <laughs> you know, like ever. So um, I think that that was really helpful and uh, it allowed me to do things that were really important. So, thank you guys. Awesome. Big round of applause. <laughs> so, Just some, just some quick uh, closing comments here. I want to, um, you know, really recognize Matt. I mean, uh, this was back in January, really. We, we kind of came up with the idea to, to put this program together, and we're thinking about how we were going to make a, make a splash with our first event here. In fact, Matt asked Colin earlier, like, hey, what have other people that have spoken at this, what have, what have they talked about? He said, uh, you're the first one, so. Good luck. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, I, Matt did this completely out of the goodness of his heart, too. He did not ask us for one dime. We offered. He said, no, I got it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. And so uh, we're, uh, we're, we're incredibly indebted and appreciative uh, of that fact. And I also want to uh, point out this is, this is kind of an interesting story. So back in January, we were thinking, OK, Matt agreed, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. Well, he agreed to do it for free, as I said. And then we get to. You know, in the season, Matt's kind of the quarterback of the Colts at this point. We get to the season, and it's like, okay, well, Matt's not going to be on the Colts anymore. And it was like, how do you call the guy and ask him if he's still going to be able to make it to our seminar? I <laughs> see so be able to do that. So we had a whole team meeting, and we're like, okay, basically, here's our here's our contingent. We're, we, our plan is we have to watch NFL free agency. You know, and we'll see based on NFL free agency that's going to dictate our success of our seminar. <laughs> so, so uh, you know. We understand that. We understand that part of it. So, uh, we're again, we're just incredibly indebted to Matt, and we know Matt. One thing Matt did not talk about today is I know he's a very uh, faithful and purpose-driven person, and um, we've done our research. And one of the projects that we know that he is uh, incredibly um, dedicated to is an organization called Cherry Water, which is dedicated to bringing clean water to every citizen in the world. Um, and so on behalf of Matt, we are going to make a donation to build a well um, for uh, in Africa uh, to bring um, fresh water to people that otherwise would not have it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even, even kids that wear Steelers World Champion shirts need clean water. 